Simon Blackburn, Professor of Philosophy, University of Cambridge. Borod Stein, Professor of Political Science, University of Gothenburg. Welcome. The state of truth, where do we begin? <laughs> you mentioned this morning, you spoke this morning about the connection between trust, trustfulness and truth. Mm -hmm. Could you both elaborate on that, uh, Simon? Would you like to start? Well, <coughs> I think there are two aspects I would separate. One is the trustworthiness of direct observation. I think this is something scientists often think is simpler than it is. Um, obviously, observations are trustworthy. I can tell at a glance there's a glass of water in front of me. Other people can tell at a glance that I've got cancer by looking at an x-ray or something. Um, some things people can tell which others can't by observation. I can't tell which mushrooms are poisonous if I go in the woods, but some people can. Um, to make observation trustworthy, you have to know how to interpret it, and that can often be quite a delicate business. But it's a business that scientific education is good at. Um, then there's the question of testimony, trust in what people tell you. And this, of course, in politics, in the news, in newspapers, media, this is the, the crunch today, because um, in the old days we thought that only trustworthy news reports were as it were produced. Now we know that very untrustworthy things are produced all over the place. And so it's correspondingly much harder to sift out trust. Now it's partly an institutional problem. There are countries where there are trustworthy institutions. I think Sweden is one. The press is trusted. In Britain the BBC is probably the best example because um, Rupert Murdoch has not got his hands on it yet. Um, so, uh, so it is not yet Fox News. Um, but one day it might become so. There's no guarantee that trustworthiness continues and it's very quick to get lost. So I think those are the two aspects of trust which I think are very important. Yeah. One, is, I'm, one I'm optimistic about, our capacity to make good observations of the world. One I'm more pessimistic about. Boom. Yeah, I think we have uh, all the difficulties that we learned this morning about finding out what is true, but there is a baseline for this, and that is that those who are paid to discover the truth in some way are impartial. They do not have beforehand political, ideological, economic interest in finding out a specific type of story, but we can trust them that they will not sort of tamper with the facts or interpret things in a way that is very partisan. And this is threatened from two sources. One is, of course, that I'm a social scientist. We have more and more think tanks, research institutes, interest organizations that are sort of paying for a specific type of interpretation of the mm. facts. So if they at all are interested in any facts, it's only the facts that they know beforehand will confirm their interest. Mm -hmm. The second comes from within universities. We have a problem with many scholars, especially in the humanities and social scientists, that sort of fall in love with a the theory. <laughs> so they are a neoclassical economist or institutionalist or behavioralist or postmodernist or whatever. So what, if they are looking for any facts, they are really in love with their theory. They spent years and years in learning this theory. And the very idea that they would find any empirical evidence that would refute their theory is alien to them. Mm -hmm. So I think the, if I back down from finding the mm -hmm. truth to mm -hmm. this idea of impartiality, mm -hmm. we have at least within universities four strong approaches that deny the mm -hmm. importance of impartiality and impartial ways of finding the truth. Postmodernists, mm -hmm. of course, to say everything is about power. Mm -hmm. We have identity politics within the university who say a person with this specific ethnic or religious identity can never have a th truth that is commensurable to another person. Mm -hmm. We have in economics the public choice orientation saying there is no such thing as impartiality, everything is about self-interest. And there are a few old style Marxists left also <laughs> I would say. Uh, so there are at least four approaches within the university system that is 
challenging this idea that actually you could do research that would refute your darling hypothesis. So we are fighting a two-front war. So who is still trustworthy? <laughs> Uh, that, that is, of course, the, the big question. We have data on this. We, uh, we here in Sweden, my department here in Gothenburg, we are engaged in a big opinion research operation known as the Society of Opinion Media. And we ask the Swedish population year after year, we terrorize them with uh, questionnaires. And usually the, the doctors, the phys win. But now and then actually the res researchers are the most trusted one. Far above politicians, journalists I can say are very low. <laughs> but it's uh, still I think we are, uh, there is some problem but still the, uh, if you ask people usually university researchers are still trusted. Much more trusted than for example hired guns that work for think tanks. And that's across uh that's a global, there aren't big differences there. <laughs> that I cannot say right yeah. out of my mind. I, I would guess so, but I think in the United States, uh, I think you have a bigger problem with uh, a partisan divide about these things than we have in the Nordic countries, yes. You said at some point that you would, uh, you like to speak truth to power. Is power afraid of truth? Oh, many times. I mean, uh, this is a famous sentence from uh, a legendary political scientist, uh, Aaron Wildavsky. And he said what people who work in political science, and especially when you do policy, anal policy analysis, which policies works best or not, you're supposed to speak truth to power. And of course, there is, there is huge interest in politics. They spend a lot of um, legitimacy and energy and money in some type of policy. And if you would stand up and say, no, this doesn't work as intended. This, this is wasted money or this is not how things operate according to our, our data. They're not always that interested in listening to you. Let me give you a concrete example. So I study what we call quality of government, which is a euphemism for saying corruption. <laughs> and and, uh, and uh, uh, most people who work in the policy sector in our country and all over the world, I could say, they are absolutely convinced that democracy, if you democratize, that would work as a cure against corruption. It doesn't, not at all. And this is, of course, not a welcome truth. They spend tons of money in what they call democracy aid, which I would never argue against democracy, but it doesn't work as a cure against corruption, no. It's a, it's a hard truth. To it's quite to hard, face. and I don't yeah, like yeah, it. It's yeah. not some. I would, I would love for democracy to f to function as a cure against corruption, but the evidence is simply not there. Is this because? Sorry, could I please go ask? ahead? Yeah, please comment. <coughs> is this because there's a confusion between cause and effect? I mean, uh, you know, as the Constitution and the founding of the United mm -hmm. States demonstrated, in order to have a working democracy, you've got to have open society. You have to have a free press, you have to have trust in universities and the educational system which brings people up to understand the world as best they can. And um, if you don't have that, then democracy simply becomes a, a power struggle in which the biggest mob wins. And if yeah. the biggest mob wins, then the biggest mob will take what money it can. Yeah. Um, so, so simply one man, one vote is very far down the line from the conditions that uh, guarantee a working democracy, a genuine democracy. But the question is, is there another system that, that would mm. work towards <laughs> the truth that would be even better? Well, if you look at the, the, the historical facts, um, we cannot do experiments, you know, with history, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> so we have to use history as natural experiments. Mm -hmm. But if you look at all the elite stable democracies in Northwestern Europe, they first did away with systemic corruption in their public sector. Mm -hmm. Then they became democracies. It was not the other way around. Mm -hmm. uh, take a simple thing. If you, have, if you organize elections, but you do not have uh, uncorrupt uh, authority to count the votes, mm -hmm. the elections will not vo work. Mm -hmm. Look at Kenya today, for yeah. example. Mm -hmm. It's also the case that uh, in, in weak de democracies, a newly elected government seem not to be able to stand against the temptation to completely fill the public administration with their political cronies. If there is an election tomorrow in Mexico, 
and uh, another party come in, 70,000 civil servants will have to leave. Mm. The lowest figure we found is Denmark, it's 26. <laughs> mm. oh, yes. we, we heard this morning that uh, it's difficult to compete with liars. Uh, it puts you in a quite tough position. Mm. What is your answer on that? Yes, I, I thought it was very interesting hearing General Hyden talk about the, the, the sort of bubble of fantasy that yeah. surrounds President Trump, but other politicians as well, yeah. I think, to, to a perhaps a lesser extent. Um, I mean, in, in Britain, we, we pride ourselves on having had, for about 150 years, an incorruptible civil service. It's always been supposed to have been like that, and I think to a large extent it was. So. I mean, bribery and so forth were pretty well unknown. Now, nobody's so sure because there's uh, the revolving door. So you become Minister of Defence, you don't actually receive bribes from the um, munitions from the defence industries, but you know that the minute you retire, you can go and sit on the board and you can be paid mega sum, mega bucks, uh, to shed a bit of your knowledge on the, on the, on the company that's employing you. And that's a kind of corruption which um, can feed back into the actual decision making. If you, you know, if the chairman of um, BAE or somebody, one of the big armaments companies, and comes and says, well, you know, would the Ministry of Defence like to buy our aeroplane? By the way, I see you're retiring in a year's time. Um, you can guess the result. Yeah. <laughs> and I think that's creeping yeah. more and more into the civil service. Yeah. That's a, we have this stupid honours system to try to, they say, you're not going to get much money, but you become a sir. How's that? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, a final question, and then we'll have a few minutes to encourage anybody of you to ask a question. A, a, a very vast uh, question, but uh, what is the future of truth? giving that quite loomy scenario we got this morning. Well, it's a wise thing. One should never predict the future. <laughs> <laughs> you will lose. Mm. What, what can you say? I mean, we may be in a difficult situation with this. Uh, there was talk about an American president uh, very much this morning, and but it may also mm. fade away. People will sort of find out mm. that this is not working. They are making... Uh, uh, um, making things up. I think, for example, in the UK, where I have lived now for two years, people will soon find out that the campaigners for Brexit were promising a mirage. Mm. The things they were promising cannot and will not be delivered. Mm. Like the UK could be in the, in the free market without paying anything, mm. or that they could be in the free market without accepting any, any uh, uh, movement, movement of labor. Of labor. Mm. This is like promising the moon, you know, mm. it's, uh, it's a mirage. And they will soon discover that it, this was not a good idea. Yeah. And yes. they will pay a high price for it. It will be a bit mm. too late, mm -hmm. probably. Too not, late my, not my question anymore. <laughs> 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 well, yes. thank you so much. Uh, w w is there anyone who would uh, like to ask one question? Oh, yeah, and you, you will need these to, to hear the, the questions. And there should be a mic somewhere. Please, yes. you in Here in the middle, the gentleman. Uh, hello. Um, yeah, so my question is for uh, Mr. Uh, Simon. Uh, so I need uh, to, excuse me, I need to switch this on. Yeah, take this one. Oh. This works. This works as well. Okay. Okay, then I take that. Yeah. Okay, I'm mic'd up. Okay, hello. hello. Can you hear me? <coughs> so, uh, isn't truth, like, is there any absolute truth? Because I think truth is more as a relative term. Uh, because uh, as a society, let's say a society believes something as true, then it is true for them. It's based on belief, right? Like truth is nothing but what we believe. So is there any absolute truth? Um, there's truth and then there's belief and beliefs are often false. Uh, the fact that uh, somebody believes something is very different from the question of whether it's true. Um, you know, I can... Uh, find somebody in the audience who believes that uh, Gwyneth Paltrow is right that you need to spend $250 on a stone to keep vampires away. 
well, that's what they believe. I don't believe it, and I don't think it's true. I don't think it's got the remotest chance of being true. So um, beliefs are one thing, truths another. And of course, whole societies can be wrong in their beliefs. Uh, the classic is the flat earth. Uh, another one is the idea that the earth was 6,000 years old, which uh, had a biblical authority until the 19th century. Um, so, you know, the, what a society believes and what is true are two, two very different things. I don't like the word absolute, as a matter of fact, because it suggests that, so, that something's done and dusted. And very often, as we heard this morning, the scientific attitude is one of, well, this is, this is where we are now. This is where the ground, ground seems firm at present, but we've, we've got to do more work. Thank you. And we have, unfortunately, a very uh, true <laughs> fact over there that that's we're running over time. Oh. So, uh, unfortunately, we will not be able to take more questions. But uh, thank you so much, both of you, and thank you thank all. You. Thank you. Thank you, yes. Thank you.